Thank you all so much for joining me for our webinar on emerging aquatic threats in Western New York. This is the fifth and final webinar in Western New York PRISM's fall webinar series. My name is Emily Thiel and I am Western New York PRISM's Education and Outreach Program Manager. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Kate Monticelli. Kate was gracious enough to join us from our neighboring PRISM region in the Finger Lakes. Kate started with the Finger Lakes PRISM as their Water Chestnut Project Manager and has since transformed her role to focus on another early invader as their Hydrilla project manager. So Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. So very quickly, I'd like to introduce our organizations. Kate and I both work at different branches of New York State's PRISM Network, which stands for Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. So this network consists of eight PRISM regions, including obviously Western New York and Finger Lake PRISM. And while we are separate organizations, we do share a similar goal of minimizing the harm caused by invasive species to New York's environment, economy, and human health through coordinated education, detection, prevention, and control measures. Now, both of our organizations have extensive watercraft inspection programs. These help boaters and fisher people to stop the spread of aquatic invasive species by making sure that their gear is cleaned, drained, and dried at the end of each outing. We also perform education and outreach efforts such as this one to help people learn about additional ways that they can help stop the spread of invasive species, usually through very simple actions in their everyday lives, such as not moving firewood or planting native species. We also do some surveying for early detection species, as well as you know, direct control and removal of invasive species. And I will mention that one of the main differences between our prism regions, beyond obviously the lands that we cover, is that Finger Lakes focuses very heavily on aquatic invasive species. And this is just given that water is such a huge part of their regional identity. Well, Western New York, we focus more on terrestrial species. And this is just one of the reasons we are so lucky to have Kate join us today. So before I go any further, I want to quickly go over this term I keep throwing around, invasive species. So I'm sure we all have some idea of what an invasive species is, but I just want to clear up any misconceptions and give you the, the straight definition. So according to New York State, an invasive species is defined as a species that is non-native to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. The key takeaway here is that a species must both be non-native and cause harm. So we have species like lilacs or apples or cows. These are non-native species, but they provide a benefit for us and therefore can't be considered invasive. And then on the flip side, we have native species that do cause harm. Like, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but poison ivy is native. So again, not an invasive species. There are also a lot of different interpretations of what we term harm. We have economic harm. And the picture here in the top right, which is of Phragmites, which you've probably all seen before along the roadside. And if you haven't before, you'll probably notice it now. So my apologies in advance. And you can't tell from this photo, but there's actually a really nice pond right behind it. And they've done studies where they see as Phragmites moves along the lakeshore, you see the property values begin to diminish. So this is an economic harm of an invasive species. We also have environmental harm. So the picture on the left here shows mile a minute. Like the name suggests, it's a very fast growing vine that has completely taken over the area and smothered any native plants that were here before. So this is an environmental harm caused by this monoculture that smothers out native species. And then lastly, we have a harm to human health. So this can be very obvious damage. You may have heard about giant hogweed. It's a very tall plant that has a very large kind of clean and blade shape flower called an umbel. The sap of this plant can cause very terrible blisters if you get it on your skin. Besides this very obvious threat to human health, we also have some more nuanced harms. So the picture on the bottom right is a stand of dead hemlock trees that were killed by the invasive hemlock woolly adelgid. And hemlocks play a really important role in filtering water without which human health may be impacted. And a lot of invasive species, they cause harm harm in all three of these categories. So like I mentioned with hemlock woolly adelgid, it does cause that harm to human health, but by killing these hemlock trees, you can damage brook trout fishery, which are tied to tourism, 
as well as environmental damage because hemlocks are such important keystone species that provide food and habitat to many other species in the area. So while Kate is going to talk about three aquatic invasive species that have the potential to do large amounts of damage in Western New York, these are by no means the only ones to keep an eye out for. So I wanted to very, very quickly introduce you to our aquatic early detection priority species, including water hyacinth, water lettuce, and yellow floating heart. The water hyacinth is a floating aquatic plant that has bulbous leaf stems and a very beautiful spike of purple flowers. Water hyacinth is a common water garden plant that can double the size of its population every two weeks. So this is a huge threat to Western New York region. We found this plant so far in five waterways in the Western New York prison region, including on Unity Island, the Erie Canal, Ellicott Creek, and most recently on Buckhorn Island and Oppenheim Park, both of which had water hyacinth in them this summer. We've since removed all the plants that we found in each of these locations, but we now have to revisit each of these areas each year to make sure that we catch any seeds or repeated releases so we can kind of stop this invasion before it happens. It's very full scale. We also want to keep a lookout for water lettuce. Again, this is another floating aquatic plant that looks kind of like an open head of lettuce floating along on top of the water. This is very a very distinctive plant. And very similarly to water hyacinth, this is a common water garden plant that will reproduce very rapidly and double its populations within several weeks. So far in Western New York, we've found this species in Ellicott Creek in 2018 and revisit this site each year. This year, we also found it in Hyde Park Lake. And this is a very resilient and large population. Over the summer, Western New York prison staff visited this park three times and in total removed about 700 plants. And this demonstrates just how quickly the species can take over an area. And then lastly, we have yellow floating heart. This is a rooted perennial plant that looks like a very small heart-shaped lily pad on top of the surface of the water. And when you look at the underside of the leaves, they are very dark purple in color, which is one of its most distinctive features. It also develops these very characteristic yellow flowers that have fringed edges. Fortunately for us, the only detection of this species in Western New York has been one on private property in Chautauqua County, which has since been managed. So if you are interested in learning more about any of these species or any of the others that Kate will talk about next, they all have profiles on our website at westernyartprison.org. And with that, I will pass it off to Kate, who will discuss three more of our top aquatic priorities in Western New York in a little bit more detail than what I've been able to do here. Wonderful. Yeah, so thanks for having me. I'm happy to talk about plants in general and apparently uh, aquatic plants are, you know, hard enough to get people interested in them. They're not just seaweed and I like them, so I'm happy to talk at length about them. <laughs> uh, I know, Emily, you already kind of went through what we'll talk about today, but we'll start with water chestnut and then hydrilla and then starry stonewort. And I have pictures uh, to help identify them, why are they important, and then go through some of the different management methods that, that are available to us. And I want to preface this with well, why do we care about these particular species? They're not necessarily widely established in our areas, in our shared areas in Western New York or in the Finger Lakes. And the, the most uh, efficient way and cost efficient way of managing invasive species is to prevent them. And so we're, we're all, always on the lookout for these particular species and we want to find them as soon as we can so that we can manage them when their populations are small and it takes fewer resources at that point. And in helping with the prevention of spreading these species, we have our watercraft steward programs that help educate people who are recreating on the water. And we have various uh, educational events, and then New York State also has regulation that prohibits the possession and transport of a, an entire list of invasive, 
species, and water chestnut and hydrilla are two of the species specified in that list. So water chestnut is this neat looking floating leafed aquatic invasive plant. So it has the, this nice rosette of triangular toothed leaves. It's an annual. So the picture on the left there is a picture of the seed with a sprout coming out of it when it soon after it first germinates in the spring. This plant grows, it'll start growing early mid-June, you know, maybe late May, depending on the water temperatures and the light availability. It'll grow its way through the water column and then form its floating rosette of leaves. It flowers you now mid-July, which is when it starts to form seeds, those little white flowers that you can see in the middle picture. Once they're done blooming, they dip back into the water and they begin to form a seed. And the seeds mature through to the end of July, beginning of August, and they're towards mid-August and late August, they'll turn brown and they'll fall off the plant at that point. They're, they're ready to grow. They'll overwinter and then they'll sprout the next year. And so I'm not, can't quite remember where this quote came from, but the one acre of water chestnut can produce enough seeds to cover 100 acres the following year. I've done the math, tracks. <laughs> you can see in the picture of the seed on the left here, <clears throat> that there are a few different stems growing from that one seed. Each stem is can form multiple rosettes, and then each rosette can grow, you know, upwards of 20 seeds per rosette. Here's a little bit better picture of the seeds. Uh, it's four spines. On the, the tip of each of those spines are recurved barbs, and this helps anchor the seed as it's growing. And when it first comes off the plant, it'll also attach to feathers or fur very easily. So this plant can spread by waterfowl flying from water body to water body, or from muskrats moving around, things like that. This tends to grow in pretty quiet water, you know, with mucky sediment. Very, very much a wetland plant or, you know, edge of the lake. It won't really grow in an area where it's subject to wave attack. In the western New York region, it's, there aren't a ton of locations that have water chestnut. I think it's primarily the the Erie Canal and then a, a couple locations down in Chautauqua County. But if you don't manage it, these are some pictures of some of our most severe infestations in the Finger Lakes region where it forms this dense mat of floating vegetation. It looks like you can walk across it. And so this shades out and outcompetes much of our native aquatic vegetation. So this changes the habitat structure and composition. So, you know, any little little bugs or fish food that are trying to live in the water, all of a sudden their habitat has changed. Any fish who want to eat, any bugs that would have been growing in there, now their food's gone. And it's changing, you know, the the physical structure of the habitat. It so it'll help <clears throat> it, you know, kind of takes over any spawning areas that fish would be utilizing. It also affects the water flow and the water chemistry, reduces dissolved oxygen. So it, it greatly impacts the aquatic community. And then what do what are people doing? with respect to the aquatic community. People want to fish, people want to swim. I don't know about you, but I definitely don't want to swim in water that looks like that.
Not to mention the feet hurt real bad. But as I mentioned, once this plant forms a mat across the water surface, it completely shades the water column. This displaces any native aquatic plants we have, affects the water quality, affects water flow. So there are several things we can do to manage a water chestnut, and it, it does depend on your goal. Are you eradicating it? Do you want it to never come back? Or do you want to suppress it and keep it from spreading, even though you might not be able to remove the infestation in its entirety? The, the main idea behind any form of management for water chestnuts um, is to really is exhaust the seed bank and prevent any new mature seed from contributing to the seed bank. Since it's an annual, if you can prevent it from setting seed, you've effectively managed it. And so yes, prevention is best, but not always possible. In the Finger Lakes region, we've utilized physical control, which is hand removal. Uh, mechanical control, we have partners that operate aquatic vegetation harvesters. So this will cut the stems in the water column, and then they remove the floating rosettes. I think theoretically dredging would be an option, but it would be very costly. Dredging would just be to remove the sediment that contains any seeds. I haven't really heard of that being used, but I think theoretically it could be. There are also herbicides available that are effective on water chestnut. And so I'll have more pictures of this from our water chestnut project that we had. An example of one of our sites that we were managing where hand pulling was actually very effective was Braddock Bay, um, just west of Rochester and Monroe County. Um, which is off of Lake Ontario. The water chestnut was detected next to this marina back in 2013. Volunteers pulled any rosettes that they saw, didn't quite get it all. And you can see in the on the east, in the corner of that cove, uh, there's some really dense green material there, and that is an entire acre of water chestnut. And so in 2014 and 2015, we had very large volunteer holes. In 2016, our control project started where we received Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding to have a strike team to uh, be dedicated full-time to surveying and pulling water chestnut. 2017, the mat's effectively gone. There's still water chestnut, and by 2018, there's only a couple plants left. And so up close and in person, this is what that looks like. 2014, there were five days of pulling, and nine tons of water chestnut were removed. We partnered with the town to use one of their waste management trucks to be able to transport the water chestnut to a, a local composting facility. And then after four years, three or four years of pulling, we had a 93% population reduction. And that population reduction still continued through into 2018. Uh, which was the end of our control project. We've since had uh, volunteer polls there each year. I think last year only, I'm not even sure if they saw any water chestnut in this location last year. The year before, there were seven plants. And so it's just a, a great demonstration of how, you know, hand polling can be effective. And you're really targeting to remove that plant from the water column before it, it produces mature seeds. So we're targeting it in July, early August. Here are some pictures of our partners in Wayne County, uh, the Soil and Water Conservation District, and has aquatic vegetation harvesters. Again, 
just a just a different strategy if if it's a very large population and you can't get a lot of people to be willing to hand pull all of it, then this is another method of control. And you can see the in the bottom picture there's a conveyor and so it's scooping up the the cut plants that are just floating through the water. What's really effective is if you are able to mechanically control water chestnut and then have people come through, hand pull anything that the harvester may have missed. For other very large, very dense populations that are that may be hard to access, chemical control is, is definitely an option. There are several permits to look into, so aquatic pesticide use permits, there may be freshwater wetland permits that are required as well. In our region, we've used these two herbicides, 2,4-D and imazamox, have been recommended for water chestnut control. These would be applied late June, early July to get good coverage before water chestnut starts to grow so dense that the leaves are stacked on top of each other. And this would still be prior to any seed formation. There is research ongoing for biocontrol, although there's nothing approved for release yet. And that's a picture of the little leaf beetles that are being grown for research. Hydrilla is a very high priority species in our region. It's named for the mythological multi-headed monster, the Hydra, where you try to cut one head off, regrow in its place. Similar idea in the growth behind this plant. It grows very quickly. It's able to grow in a, in a variety of environmental conditions from low light to high light temperature ranges. It also affects uh, oxygen levels, and you can see the way it, in the bottom right picture, the way the stolons and rhizomes kind of creep across what would be the lake bottom and then grow up. You can imagine that growing in the picture on the left, those are fish spawning sites, and so this would cover the habitat that's used by fish for fish spawning. As Emily mentioned earlier, this is another invasive species that greatly reduces your property value. It grows so thickly in the water, it really impedes any recreational activity in the water, any navigation. Again, it, it affects the fish, so it will then affect the recreational fishing. And it costs a lot to control. So this is a perennial plant, not an annual plant. So there is a Great Lakes Hydrilla Collaborative that produced a risk assessment early in 2019. And an, an economic impact analysis was done at that time. And they estimated that between 70 and $500 million annually, it would cost to manage hydrilla if it were to become established in the Great Lakes region. So when I give this presentation in the finger, like let's say, we're number one. And that's due to having hydrilla in our Ontario watershed already. But in the Western New York region, you know, this just came out. So the caption at the bottom of this picture is from 2016. Then the risk assessment came out early 2019. And I think since then, there's been one or two more hydrilla infestations discovered in the Western New York region. Not sure if that bumps you up to a higher priority level. But either way, it's a risk. 
So hydrilla is a rooted perennial plant. It's got long slender stems with whorls of leaves occurring in the same plane around the stem, and those leaves are toothed. It will typically grow in near shore waters, so up to depths of about 25 feet. It'll start to grow when the water is warmer than 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It reproduces by seed. It also produces little vegetative buds called turions. It produces turions that are grown underground called tubers. They're like a little potato bulb. It can also spread by fragmenting. So if a fragment or a little chunk of this plant breaks off and it floats along, if that break off happens early enough in the season, it can then grow roots and root down somewhere else. And so this plant also forms really dense mats, not on the water surface, but through the water column. And then we're trying to find hydrilla. It's really important to identify it correctly. There is a native aquatic plant species that looks very, very similar to it. So the first thing you look at is the leaf arrangement. Is there one leaf coming out of the stem at a time? Or is there a pair of leaves coming out opposite each other? Or is there a whorl of leaves coming out of more than two leaves arranged together? How many leaves are in that whorl if there is a whorl of leaves? And are the leaf margins smooth or toothed? So for hydrilla, the leaves grow in a whorl. So usually, so there's generally four to eight leaves in a whorl of these leaves. In our area, it typically grows in whorls of five. So there should be five leaves growing around the same point in the stem. And these leaves are toothed. And I mentioned the, the native plant that looks very similar has whorls of three leaves and the leaves are smooth. So these are really key identifying features for this plant. Hydrilla will also have the presence of those tubers in the sediments, but since you have to dig for them, you're probably less likely to see them, to use them for identification. So in Western New York, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Buffalo has been managing the Erie Canal population. And then I believe the DEC is leading the management of a couple ponds that are infested with hydrilla in Orchard Park. For this species in particular, prevention is the most cost-effective management strategy. It's very hard to get rid of. It takes a long time and lots and lots of resources. As far as physical management, very small, like individual plants may be removed by hand, but you have to make sure you have all of the fragments. And you also have to make sure that there are no remaining tubers in the sediments that will re-sprout from the tubers the following year. Diver-assisted suction harvesting, which is the picture in the upper right. People will dive and pull the plants and then send them through a vacuum to remove them from the water column. Again, it's subject to the same restrictions that hand removal is, it's only good for a very small population, and you really have to make sure you remove any fragment and all of the tubers from the sediment as well. Benthic mats, they're showed in the bottom picture. This is a small isolated pond that was discovered to have hydrilla in our region. And so the benthic matting is suppressing the plant, shielding them from any light to keep them from growing. And 
Mechanical harvesting, so aquatic vegetation harvesting, is really not an option for this plant if you're trying to eradicate it. You would just be spreading it if you were to try to chop it up. It would create too many fragments. But dredging was a management strategy that we were able to use successfully in our region, as well as chemical control. There's no real biocontrol approved for this plant. If you had in, in isolated ponds, I believe grass carps would be an option, though it would require a permit, as would you know, most of these management strategies. So a small marina in our region was found to have hydrilla in 2018. In early 2019, when the lake levels were low, we were able to contract and dredge this very small marina in the bottom picture, where the bulldozer is, was the um, you know, boat launch portion of the marina. And that was the main area where the hydrilla was growing. And so we were able to dredge, I believe, 150 cubic yards of sediment while making sure that the, the interior of the marina was dewatered, blocked off from the lake, and all of the equipment was washed before and after all of this work. The sediment was transported off site and buried in an upland area where it could no longer, where there's no chance of it washing into any other water body. One thing to note is the the sediment along the docks, along the piling, we were not able to dredge according to our permit so that we wouldn't destabilize it. And that is where hydrilla grew back the following year. We were able to follow up with an herbicide treatment that has been successful. We have not found hydrilla in this location since then. So it's costly, but this is a management strategy. There are a few other areas on the same lake, on Kiyuga Lake in our region, that have been under management uh, using a few different herbicides. I am not an, a pesticide applicator, but these are the herbicides that have been approved for use for our project at various points in time. Pleridone is a systemic herbicide, so it's applied and then as the plant grows, it takes the herbicide in and is translocated throughout the plant compared to something like copper that is a contact herbicide where it's applied once to damage the plant to prevent it from producing any propagules. And so starry silmar was our, our third, last but not least, species to talk about today. A little different from the previous plants that we've talked about, this is a macroalgae. Grows in depths up to nine meters and slow moving aquatic habitat. In order to tell a macroalgae apart from another plant is if you try to crush it, you'll hear a distinct pop. And so each segment of the plant, in the, of the macroalgae in the picture, each segment is one cell. And so that, that pop, or that when you crush it, the cell wall breaking. That's how you can tell any macroalgae apart from other plants. For starry stonework specifically, you really need to look at the ball bills, which are the little vegetative structures that it grows from. And they're pictured in the bottom right photo, little star-shaped white ball bills. They're attached to the rest of the vegetation by a rhizoid, which looks like clear fishing line. And then <clears throat> the rest of this macroalgae, there are walls of branchlets and compared to our native macroalgae, 
don't know how clear it is in this picture, but I like to say that this macroalgae has crazy arms where the, the branchlets don't really all point in one direction. They're all kind of different lengths. Again, the main, the main uh, identifying feature here is the star-shaped ball bill. Here's some more pictures of it. Similar to hydrilla, it grows really dense and it just forms these mats of vegetation in the water column. And here's some close-ups of the star-shaped bulldoze. And so both starry stonewort and hydrilla actually are typically grow later in the season or become much more noticeable later in the growing season. And so these are plants that you would see more likely in late July, into August, into September. Starry Sonor is not really mapped in much of Western New York. In our region, it's typically very underreported. It's not, you know, immediately obvious like something like water chestnut would be. It's, it can be hard to identify for sure unless you have those star-shaped baldos to go by. And so another program that we have working with our PRISM is the Starry Stonework Collaborative. And so I have a few slides from that program here. There are volunteer citizen scientists and a panel of experts and collaborators all working together to learn more about starry stone work. There's actually a lot that is not known about it. Now, similar to the other invasive plants that we've talked about, it grows very quickly and very aggressively, uh, outcompetes the native plants affects the spawning habitat for fish. It may have water quality impact. And then it physically inhibits the use of the waterways, fishing. But there is a lot that we don't know about it, including eradication management strategies. So all of these control strategies that really, really just give this macroalgae a haircut. None of these really affect the, the vegetative ball bills that our stonework grows from each year. In terms of physical management, there's hand removal, fiber-assisted suction harvesting, and I haven't heard of benthic gnats being used, but I'm sure theoretically they could be. There are hand removal efforts in the Finger Lakes region. Again, it's removing the biomass from the water column, but it's not necessarily preventing it from growing the following year because we're not getting to uh, the bulbils in the sediment. There are also aquatic vegetation harvesters being used to cut and remove the biomass from the water column. And then a lake in our region just this year has tried to use an algicide, which I've heard was effective in knocking down the biomass in the water column. But again, it doesn't really affect the ball bills, which is what the algae is growing from. So there's, there's more research being done on that, and hopefully there will be some uh, best management practices to come out of the Star Stonework Collaborative. And so again, the, the most cost-effective and most efficient way of managing the species is to prevent them before they even spread. Unfortunately, that's not always possible. So our next best thing is early detection. 
And so if you see any things that resemble the plants we looked at today, take a photo or a sample, send it to someone in the prism or a lake association for, for identification, and then you can get it mapped and get people who need to know about it to know about it so we can manage it. Great, Kate, thank you. I do want to add just a couple of things just from kind of a Western New York perspective. So for water chestnut, we are beginning to kind of see a resurgence of the species in the southern tier portion of Western New York. We currently have a water chestnut working group working with some of our partners down in Chautauqua County. I see a couple of them on the line today, so thank you for joining us. If you are interested in joining that or you want to learn more about it, please feel free to contact me and we can get you in touch with the right people if you are interested in engaging in that further. For starry stonewort, we have recently found new infestations of that in the, the Buffalo area. So that is a new one that we haven't had a lot of yet. So it'll be interesting to see how we begin to survey for that in the coming years and see if we can find any new additional infestations. Not that we want to find more infestations, but if they're out there, we do want to find them. Better to know and about them. Absolutely, yes. We also have one of our students here at Sydney Buffalo State is actually doing research on it as well, so they can kind of figure out when that infestation first started. So just kind of from, you know, a Western New York perspective, we kind of know a little bit more about what's going on here than Kate May, just because she doesn't work in this area. Um, so yeah, these are all really important species to keep a lookout for. And again, if you are able to submit an observation through INEP Invasive, that would be great. We all have alerts set up for that sort of thing. You can also contact me. I did put my email address on the screen here, right underneath my name. So if you ever have a question or even if you're not certain about an ID, we strongly encourage you to get in contact with us anyway. We would much rather have someone present a false positive than worry about not being corrected, not reported at all. Um, so I do see a couple of questions. So if I manually remove the water chestnut plant before it seeds, and I leave the plant in the water if I take them out with me. So the plant will continue to grow. It does not need to be rooted to the sediment for it to grow. And it will also branch uh, into other rosettes. So it's really best to remove the entire rosette from the water column. Disposal process for the removed invasive species. Uh, that can depend on the species. And it will also depend on each you know, specific location, what you're able to do. Broadly, we try to remove the plants from the water column and send them to an area where it's upland, they can dry out, and there's no chance of them re-entering the water body. So if that is a compost pile that you have permission to use, if it's something like chemical control, you're not removing plant material from the water, then there's no place to put it. I got a, a private question as well, very similar vein. Is there a risk for water chestnut to reinfest if composted? As long as it's not next to the water body? Not, no, once it dries out, it dies. I guess you might want to be cognizant if uh, waterfowl frequent the area where your compost is. I wouldn't want them to spread the seeds before they were able to dry out. And then your, your other option might be to put them in garbage bags for a couple of weeks to try to solarize them. Or I don't don't like the option, but send them send them out with the garbage. And then are herbicides used to control invasives harmful to the native aquatic plants? So that will depend on the specific herbicide. 
and the, the dosage that it's applied at. So for something like fluoridone that's used to treat hydrilla, it's applied at a very low concentration that hydrilla is very susceptible to, but it doesn't greatly affect any of the other species. For something like a contact herbicide, that, you know, that could affect the native plants. I guess the flip side of that is if you're not using the herbicide and you're not able to control that infestation of an invasive species, then your native plants aren't going to be there anyway. And so we've come across that with our some of our water chestnut sites where there, there really aren't native plants under the water chestnut to be affected. And the, the herbicide applicators that we've worked with in the past are they're very good about being being pretty accurate as far as their spot treatments. So again, it'll it depends on the plant, it depends on uh, the herbicide being used, the application method, and the rate that it's being applied. Doug also says in the chat, herbicide effect also depends upon the ability to limit drift away from site. Mm -hmm. All right, we have some great questions come in. Again, thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day. And once again, thank you to Kate. Excellent presentation.